Oh. Okay, I said all of that without unmuting the microphone. So good morning to you, it's 5 a.m. UK time. Thank you very much, Mike, for alerting me to that. I'm about to introduce you to Nick Parkin uh, and a background and introduction to synthetic yacht rig rigging. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Um, everyone around the world, welcome, um, whatever time it is um, and wherever you are. Um, now, the next 45 minutes, um, I'm gonna take you through really the background introduction to uh, synthetic yacht rigging. Um, some of it is fairly technical um, and, and other is uh, really very sort of more of informational. So, Nick, we nice able to see you. Oh, sorry. I can do that. Yeah, we can see the presentation anyway. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, um, there seems to be a problem with my camera, but, um, so I hope that's, that's okay. Go ahead, no problems. Yeah, sure, thank you. So basically the uh, kind of brief agenda is, um, that I'll take you through is the background, really introduction to synthetic composite rigging, and that'll look at uh, all the different um, fiber types and, and uh, construction types. And then specifically, I'll, I'll um, actually just home in on HMPE rigging, um, which is really uh, what is going to, to, to dominate um, the sort of um, lower cost um, areas of the market. So cruisers, cruiser races, and those areas, and probably is the, um, you know, is, is the fiber that um, marine surveyors will, will come across most. Uh, and also one, uh, a type of fiber that um, would naturally fit into the realm of um, the marine surveyor uh, with the other, some of the other uh, fibers being more in the realm of the specialist rigging companies and um, requiring more of a specialist um, uh, to, uh, to actually survey those. So just a uh, slide to take care of legalities, you know, we're all in the business and um, so uh, we can quickly skip over that. So in terms of milestones um, in, in, in basically rigging, so um, we, we know that early standing and running rigging was really three-stranded, hard uh, hemp fiber rope. And then um, effectively it's indicated that the first kind of uh, metallic shrouds in galvanized wire were used in around 1952. And, and um, you know, that exactly if that was the first date is, is not that clear, but certainly this is an account of, of possibly some of the first usage. And then synthetic rigging or man-made fibers was really introduced in the, uh, around the late 1980s. Um, and effectively what happened there was of course the, the composite industry in terms of composite construction and the fibers being used there, first in the aerospace industry. And then of course that, that moving into the marine um, um, and, and of course the marine construction um, space is actually what spurred the, the fibers and, and the uh, new types of, of fiber. So it really is, is kind of becoming a bit of a revolution because we're actually seeing, um, we'll see that it, it actually touches not only standing rigging, but also a lot of approaches to, to running rigging and lifelines and, and all sorts of other things. So I would suggest that um, yes, it's an evolution, but many aspects are also kind of revolutionary. So we know that, uh, as we said earlier, that we started with hemp rope, then we went through a period of ready steel and then standard steel wire rope, so galvanized steel, and, and now into synthetic rope. Um, and essentially, Brian Toss, um, an, an American um, who owns a uh, US rigging business, suggested that wire rope will be a 150-year anomaly in the history of sailing boat rigging. And, and, and that, that might, might well be, be true. So I think also that this is a really a disruptive technology in a lot of ways, as we would suggest if something like this came along in, in other industries. Um, and, and effectively, we probably will see um, over time 
significant, if not, you know, complete replacement of stainless steel uh, wire um, with, uh, with, with fiber um, rigging. And since the marine surveyor will increasingly encounter this type of rigging, that's why we really need to understand this new technology. And this will enable them, as I suggest, with respect to certain types and certain types of fibers, uh, would naturally lead to sort of an extension of, of what they might do. Whereas today, with as we said, with the um, with carbon fiber rigging and um, and the other more exotic types, um, they more rarely are in the realm of the specialist rigging company. Uh, for example, companies like Southern Spars and any number of companies in the U.S. who, who specialize in that. And then, uh, then a quite an interesting quote at the bottom, um, which I guess is is true for for many of these things. Um, but we need to take the the magic out with uh, with a little bit of um, sound understanding of of what happens. Now, if we talk about standing rigging, and we will go through that first, as I suggested on the agenda, the the primary function of standard rigging is ready to transfer the tensile forces between a number of points in space to prevent excessive de deformation between those. So we know that the rigging um, supports, the, supports the mast and that the rigging um, is taken to the mast at various points to achieve that. Um, and, and to achieve this from a um, synthetic rigging point of view, continuous fibers are generally placed next to each other in a bundle um, but mainly longitudinally orientated to, to achieve this. Now, the initial performance of the standing rigging system is primarily dependent on a number of things. One is the fiber that's used in the system, uh, the packaging or the density and degree of orientation. So we know here that, that effectively um, we need to, to, uh, to have a um, zero degree orientation of the fibers. Um, to actually maximize the amount of fibers that are in the actual load path. And it's interesting because um, obviously we're trying to reduce weight. So, you know, as is typical in, in composite engineering, we would try to orientate as many of the fibers in, in the direction of the load as possible. And it's been suggested um, that some of the um, carbon lowers on things like the TP-52s, that if someone was, if one of the crew members was actually slammed hard against them, that they might actually be able to damage them from the point of view that they are not loading them longitudinally, but they're loading them in a direction where rarely you have very little, you have little or no fiber orientation. And then the other aspect is really the properties of such fibers. So we know that, um, we, we have a wide range of fibers and we have new fibers coming on the market as well. Um, and these have different, you know, vastly different properties in terms of their, their, their tensile strengths and their compressor strengths. Though, what is of ma major interest to us is actually the tensile strength. Um, the, uh, and, and so the fibers that, that, that typically um, can be used uh, in, in composite rigging, which may not be as suitable for your typical composite construction of fibers whose properties are, are excellent, um, basically in, in, in tension, but, no, but not necessarily good in compression because we don't require um, any compression. There's rigging components or tension only members in terms of the way that they, um, that they contribute. Then the durability of the chosen fibers and, and their fatigue life. So there, there are a couple of things that we'll look into in detail here. And, and in terms of durability, um, there are also things, of course, that uh, a lot of these fibers uh, obviously can suffer from things like chafe. Um, also, a lot of them are, are uh, suffer from degradation from, from ultraviolet light, which is also a factor. And then also, the situation is that there is, while they have a potentially a good fatigue life, um, again, how good the fatigue life is in the practical application depends on a number of, of variables, which, which we'll look into as well. And then, of course, there's, there's another aspect, which is the choice of whether you're using continuous or non-continuous rigging. In other words, do you have, uh, you know, continuous um, you know, fibers that run uh, through the rig, or do you actually have um, the, the basically rigging components stop, for example, at the spreaders with, with links, et cetera. 
Now, let's take a moment and look at some fibers. Um, so many types of synthetic fibers have been discovered in recent years. And we know that the only place where there's the money for the R&D and the development um, is, is in fact in the aerospace industry. And so this really drives them. Uh, we said most of the high performance fibers have impressive tensile strength, uh, except for carbon fiber, which actually has a very good tensile strength as well as very good compressive strength. And in fact, the tensile and compressive strength of or typically of carbon fiber are fairly similar. And that's what makes it highly suited, of course, to composite construction um, in, in terms of, you know, obviously a material for, for composite construction of hulls and things like that. Of course, in the, uh, you know, with respect to, to rigging, we would again, again, utilize its tensile strength, but it's, it's, uh, it's good compressive strength is, um, is really not a value that is exploited when you use it in rigging. Um, and again, here, the, um, with, with yacht rigs, the mast, the spreaders, the struts are the only components taking compressive force. As we said, the shrouds or the stays operate really as tension only structural members. And we said that the modern fibers have the, the you know, impressive tensile properties, um, which make them ideal for standing rigging. Now, looking more closely in terms of fibers, um, effectively, one is the type of fiber that they are, and then of course, the other one is the brand name or the brand name that we might know them by. Um, so effectively, we have a fiber called PBO, and we'll look at uh, them in a little more detail as we move forward. Of course, we have carbon fiber, as we've suggested. We have Aramid, we have H HMPE, and LCP. So basically, PBO fiber, um, and it's, it's really this uh, polybenzooxazolo, and um, effectively, it was, was manufactured in, in, in 1980 or, um, and invented in 1980 and manufactured by, by Toyobo. Um, and then it's, it's a generic fiber and it's known in, in, um, for rigging purposes as being PBO fiber. Then we know carbon fiber um, and, and uh, effectively this has been in the industry uh, for a number of years. Uh, and then basically carbon fiber has different kind of um, variants which, which have different um, modulus and therefore some are, are have better properties than others, but with the better properties goes, uh, goes higher cost. And so throughout the, for rigging, there are a number of different, um, you know, qualities of carbon fiber with different moduli that are used depending on, on, on of course, where you're using them. So for example, um, you know, your um, America's Cup application would use the higher, you know, the, the best possible fibers and, and the cost is not necessary and um, a problem, of course, whereas if you were using it on, um, on say, something like a, a, a possibly a TP52, you might use um, uh, one of a lower modulus and, and so on. And, and as I said, the, the, um, the higher the modulus, the higher the cost. Um, then in terms of the, the another fiber, which we would also know, potentially know well, is fiber cool, which is an aramid, which is aramid fibers. And we would typically know Kevlar. And Kevlar has been around for many years and, is, and of course has been used in yacht sails um, and, and in ropes and in many other areas. Um, and, and of course there's the, um, there's the Kevlar brand name, which was the original DuPont name. And then um, it has also been been made and, and um, sold under other brand names like Tuaron, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and again, um, you know, Kevlar is, um, is a significant uh, fiber that, that, is, that is well known and well proven in the industry. Then the other uh, types of fiber is uh, HMP, HPME, as we suggested. So this is a ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, often called just HPME for short. Um, and effectively, it is known as, as spectra or dynema. And this is um, the fiber that is making inroads into the um, lower end of the um, synthetic or, or uh, composite rigging um, industry uh, as it is um, 
you know, very high performance at, at, at a low cost. Um, and of course comes in, uh, you know, and then of course these fibers come in various forms in the way that we use them. And, and we'll look at that in a moment. Then the other fiber is one called LCP, which is uh, liquid crystal polymer. And we typically know this under its uh, trade name of uh, Vectran. Vectran again has been used a lot in, um, as the core of, of, of ropes that we uh, use in the sailing industry. Um, and we'll, we'll see some interesting aspects of Vectran. So Vectran is fairly similar in its properties um, actually to um, HMPE, but the only one of the significant problems with uh, Vectran is that it is highly sensitive to ultraviolet light and therefore has to always be used uh, uh, with a cover or um, with, with some form of, of sheath. And, and we'll, we'll look at, at those aspects. So in terms of approaches for rigging, we have obviously, as we indicated, continuous rigging. So this is uses continuous fibers in the vertical and diagonal shroud elements are fused to form a single piece of rigging. And, um, you know, and this means that the diagonals, um, uh, the, the diagonals and everything are combined into, um, into a, basically into a single set of fiber, um, continuous fibers. So you will see that typically is the, um, when you look at a rig which uses continuous um, rigging, you can see a picture of it um, on the right here. You will see that what happens is that as you traverse the spreaders, um, the rigging below the spreaders actually becomes uh, thicker as you pick up uh, the additional strength requirements and you pick up the bundles that came from, from above. Then there is endless um, winding of single elements. So these elements um, effectively would be linked, but each element is actually um, wound continuously wound around two thimbles, um, and then to, to create really a, um, a a cable with uh, with with two ter with the two terminations, um, and that is then used as an element. And again, that would of course. Uh, have links at the spreaders, uh, etc. Then we have a fiber bundled rod rigging. So this is, in a way, sort of like the use of, of, of separate fibers, but they are protruded rods, and they are bundled together to achieve the, the target strength. So you can imagine them as almost like wire rigging, but without the, without the, the bundles being twisted together. Um, and, and again, um, they have special, um, you know, the, the, these bundles are brought into special end fittings where they are typically bonded in place. Then we get fiber solid rod rigging, which is effectively uh, very similar to, to um, steel rod rigging, uh, except for the, um, it is actually solid formed um, fiber, which is actually, um, which is actually a, a single, you know, actually molded as a single piece. Um, and again, um, as we said, that is identical effectively to, um, to rod rigging and comes in either a brown or, um, or an airfoil um, shape. Then we have a rope rigging. So rope rigging um, effectively is, um, you know, typically of the, it's a fiber, so in a rope form, typically braided, what we would term single braid, and um, or otherwise they, they might be fibers in a parallel strands, strand form and they encased in the protective uh, polymer sheath. Those are the two, two kind of options. Um, and if you look at terminations, there, there are various types of terminations that we suggested based on um, actually the, the, the type of um, the form of the rigging that you have. Um, and so for with continuous types of rigging or um, you effectively have the, the rigging is wound round the, t the, the terminals itself um, as, as part of the manufacturing process. And with fiber rod rigging, the fiber bundles are typically bonded into the end fittings. Um, and with the parallel, you know, the parallel fiber type, uh, you'll find that special, special um, 
terminals are used by the companies that uh, provide that rigging. With a braided rope form, it is actually spliced using uh, a locked Brummel splice around very special uh, thimbles, and we'll look at um, those um, later in this presentation. So here we have a slide which indicates the diff some of the different types of terminations. Um, and we can see the, um, on, on the left-hand side, we can see the um, factory sheathed uh, terminated parallel aramid type of rigging terminators. We can see the ones for parallel fiber rigging in the center. And then the braided rope terminal ones uh, we can see on, on the extreme um, right-hand side. So that just kind of gives you uh, an, an idea of the, of the different, you know, physio of different types that are, that are used. So we can also kind of take a look at this of saying, well, you know, the old and the new. So here on the right-hand side, we have the new um, type of termination, ter terminating fitting that we would use um, on, on rope rigging. Um, and we can see that, uh, you know, kind of the old, it has an aspect of the solid thimble in it. And again, it can be used either with a pin um, or it can be used uh, with, uh, with a lashing. So, so this terminal will be able to suit both those purposes. You can see that um, the fitting itself is, um, is hard anodized aluminum. And you can see that where the, where the pin would go through the fitting, there is that uh, layer um, or whether it would insulate the fitting from the, from the, the pin um, on the rigging screw uh, for obviously for purposes of preventing electrolysis. And again, the old and the new from a point of view of, of lashings, um, we can see that, um, that here we have um, on, on, on the left-hand side, the old kind of style um, of, of lashing that we might do on rigging. And on the right-hand side, we can see here that, we, um, that, we're, that there is a, obviously a sheathed um, shroud coming down and then where you, the a lashing is used. Um, to, to attach that and the the actual thimble that you see there is um, is actually hard a hard anodized um, uh, terminated fitting uh, which is also typical but in this case we will see later that this type of fitting is actually not ideal because if we uh, remember from the previous slide we would have seen that the end fitting was much more of a thimble shape which is essential to reducing the, the amount of fatigue uh, that, the, uh, that the terminator puts into the, uh, into the fibers um, of, of, of the rigging rope. Then in terms of, of sheathing or covering, uh, here we can see that uh, there are various types. Um, and effectively, we, we, we can see that, um, that they use particularly with some fibers to uh, prevent moisture from getting to the fibers um, and ultraviolet light, but in a lot of cases, um, uh, UV light is, is what we're really protecting against. Um, and effectively, as we said, many of the fibers need to be sheathed um, or protected. Um, one of the exceptions to that is actually H HMPE, which can be used um, sheathed, if you wish, or unsheathed, uh, uncovered. But to be effective, this really, this, this sheath or cover must prevent exposure of the fibers to, to ultraviolet light. And really, the, this next slide really highlights some of the usage of the different fiber types. And, and really, we can see here um, that the uh, synthetic uh, HMPE uh, is really the, the um, because it's cost effective, um, and effectively easy to use, it starts to to present itself really in in, in the lower um, in the lower co lower end of the market or the lower cost end of the market. So again, if we look at um, you know really the generic advantage of of synthetic rigging, um, you know gains in strength to weight ratio, lower weight aloft, of course, which is which is very important. Um, and, and also lower weight when compared to metal attachments. Um, typically the terminators can be lighter weight. Um, the ability potentially in a lot of cases to 
uh, to easily inspect where it's where it's not covered. Um, and then, of course, we have um, because of the um, reduced weight aloft, we have an increases in the writing moment of the craft, reduced forward aloft pitching, again because we 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 have less weight high up in the rig, um, and and we have generally a potential for lower center of gravity, and and potentially either better performance with your current keel or, or reduction in keel weight. We just remember that the synthetic rope standing rigging potentially will always be larger in diameter than the stainless steel wire it replaces. And this will result in higher drag, but the, the significant reduction in weight aloft is, is really of great benefit um, and outweighs the increase. And effectively, here with respect to synthetic rigging usage, we're finding that effectively it's being used throughout uh, the industry, uh, right from, of course, you know, dinghies, um, off the beach, multi holes, right through to high end craft. Um, and the subsequent slides will focus on actually um, HMPE standing rigging. Um, now, Synthetic rigging properties. The first one we'll look at is stretch. So the size of synthetic rigging is not chosen by equivalent strength. It is chosen by equivalent stiffness. So if you look at the, so effectively, if we look at this, equivalent stiffness is calculating using really the modulus of elast elasticity. So the wire rope rigging um, has a different modulus of elasticity. So it is actually stiffer for its cross section than, than the fibers are. So effectively what we have to do is to get the same effective elasticity, we actually go for, we have to go for a larger cross section uh, in the fiber rigging. Now this is, this is and this is very important. Um, and as a result of this, what happens is actually on average, the fiber rigging, if we talk about um, HMPE, is actually of the order of three times stronger than the wire rope rigging it replaces. Now, that, that statement is an interesting one because as we will see later, the strength that you gain there will actually be over time eroded by UV exposure, and we'll look at that in more detail. Um, but effectively, the evolution in, in synthetic rigging, you know, has resulted in significant reduction in stress characteristics, um, and of course, um, great reductions in the weight. And as we said, exposure of HMPE rigging to ultraviolet radiation of the time uh, results in reduction in the breaking strength. And, and this is a very important factor, and this is one where um, you know, the increasingly, as this becomes, as, as HMPE becomes more and more utilized, uh, people like the insurance companies are, are often unsure. Um, and because of things like service life, what is the effective service life of this type of rigging? Then the other aspect of synthetic rigging, one of the properties is creep. So with the, with the exception really of, of carbon fiber and um, Vectran, um, all of the other fibers exhibit creep. So creep really means that actually your rigging component will get longer over time. And that it will not return to its original length. So there, there are some aspects that of, of creep that, that will return in a short period of time after use but there is an aspect of creep that, that will not. And so, again, but if you creep becomes a problem if you load the rigging over a certain percentage of its breaking strength. So again, we said that by, by having to size for, for equivalent stretch, we are actually stronger. So the loads that we're putting on the rigging um, in terms of what percentage they are of, of the breaking strength of the rigging, um, it has also now come down. And so effectively, 
that is also helping us to manage creep. But typically, we would not want the, um, you know, the, the, the loads, the static loads to be more than about 20% of the braking strength. Otherwise, you, you, will, you will tend to, to have um, more, more creep. But again, this is something that, as we say, you, you, you is kind of part of it we inherit and part of it's designed in. Then again, another property is expansion. And I'll, I'll go fairly quickly over this slide, but um, a lot of fibers actually have negative expansion, unlike metals that have positive expansion. So um, rigging components actually get shorter as the temperature goes up, not longer. So if you can imagine you have an aluminum mast and then you have a synthetic rigging component. Um, but again, in practice, this has not really been anything of any, of any significance or, or any real, real problem. Um, but again, it's just a very interesting uh, fact. Um, then the next aspect is the actual fatigue in HMP rope rigging. Now, I think the statement at, at, at the bottom of the slide um, is, is really significant. Um, and I think that basically also, we don't really understand, even in rigs that have used wire, what actually, what actually the fatigue cycles have been on that particular rig. Um, as a surveyor, if we come in to survey um, a rig, uh, we, we really don't necessarily have all the history as to uh, how much racing has the boat done and how much offshore um, you know, cruising has the boat done, where has it been, um, all of these kind of things. So what really happens is that the service life of, of rigging is really set to, uh, a, you know, a period which would be within, you know, comfortably within um, any, you know, kind of uh, fatigue cycles that, that, that would present a problem. And again, the various, you know, standards organizations would suggest um, service life for, um, for stainless steel rigging, dependent upon usage, etc. But when we come to HMPE rigging, there is, there is a number of factors that, that go into this, and that is obviously the amount of exposure to ultraviolet light, creep, because actually um, creep does in a small way um, affect fatigue because creep actually because the, the, the rigging component gets longer, of course it gets you know, uh, marginally thinner, etc., and then bending fatigue, which which is the bending of the fibers, and now this is due potentially to 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 poor what we call D over D and G over D ratios, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this has all got to do with the end fittings and the spliced eye throat length and and things of that. And then there are other uh, lesser causes which are really not things that we that we would worry too much about. Now, the other, the other, uh, this table here just gives you an idea of um, the, uh, you know, the, the breaking strength of HMPE fiber, five millimeter versus um, stainless steel one by nineteen three one six, and gives you an idea of um, of of the differences in in breaking strength there. Um, and as I said, um, and then again, of course, equivalent stretch sizing would tell us. You know, so if you are rigged today with five millimeter stainless steel wire, um, effectively you would be, to, for equivalent stretch sizing, you would have to be larger than that. The next size up, for example, in, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, Dyneema SK75 or, or Dynice Dux would be seven millimeter, okay? So again, there is, you know, there, there is a few different sizes available and um, equivalent stretch sizing will force you to whatever the, uh, the, the next size up uh, that's available. Now, we just spoke in, in, in the previous slide about, um, you know, the, the um, D over D ratio and, and G over D ratio, et cetera. Now, particularly when we use uh, fiber rigging, uh, we have to use the correct terminators. That's why I suggested that, that, um, that the round terminator in one of my pictures, um, uh, you know, 
effectively is not really suitable because here the throat angle is very important uh, with respect and it has to be of, of a proper thimble shape. Uh, otherwise, the fatigue becomes a big issue. Now, we have to remember that we have to be very, very careful about fatigue with respect to standing rigging. Running rigging is slightly different because we potentially can, um, you know, worry less there because of the fact that the um, the fatigue cycles may be less, um, and and it could not potentially be uh, not be life threatening, um, and and potentially easy easy to replace. So here we can see the um, requirement for the throat angle, um, and we can see the bend radius um, of of that thimble, um, and and those are very important for as we said for for primary for standing rigging. Uh, again, they are good practice for running rigging. Um, the the g over d ratio is is actually the diameter of the of the of the fiber um, rope uh, versus the actual diameter of the u shape in in the thimble itself now the range is the best for 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 lowest fatigue the range one point zero five to one point five is is best so if you had um, you know, obviously, if you had a five millimeter uh, rope, you wouldn't want to be more than um, than seven point five mil uh, in the U shape. But typically, around the uh, one point zero five or one point one is typically um, a really good place to be. Now, the other ratio we spoke about was the um, actually the um, D over D ratio. So this becomes important as well. So. And this is really the obviously the um, diameter of the curvature versus the diameter of the line that you are putting around that curvature. So at a D over D ratio of two, the strength of the line is reduced by about 85%. And at a D over D ratio of one, the line strength is only 50%. And that's the line strength of new line. But remember, in any, in any eye, there are basically two legs. So even if we reduce, our strength is reduced by 50% in each leg, the net result is that the eye still has 100% of the line strength or the breaking strength of the line. But I would suggest, therefore, that, that it, so the minimum is set at, at, at a D over D of two you would definitely not want to go any less than that. And preferably higher because you actually have less fatigue. Remember that, that while a, a, a D over D ratio of two is acceptable from a point of view of strength retention, the fatigue in the fibers is higher. Um, and so from a pure fatigue point of view. So again, for standing rigging, you would want to be up at, at greater than five, and we said even as high as eight. Um, then in terms of the rope construction, even within the, the twisted yarns of the rope, uh, there is also um, causes the filaments to obviously rub on each other and, and, and also um, has an, an aspect of, of fatigue. So over time, um, you know, they, they, it, you lose strength in service. Um, so again, is that we want to try to, wherever possible, just reduce the amount of fatigue that, 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 that will occur over time. Now, ultraviolet light is, um, as we said, a lot of fibers are sensitive to ultraviolet light and have to be used sheathed. HMPE can be used sheathed or unsheathed. Uh, some riggers have used the sheathed and then um, have actually maintained after um, uh, an, an eight-year period that the strength reduction was six uh, percent. So, from from that point of view, they you know they have done well. But really, that 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 rigging component is still uh, being subjected to the other types of fatigue based on fiber fatigue, based on the design of the end fittings and all those kind of things. So, um, 
it, it, from, it may still have reached the end of its fatigue life with respect to the fatigue around the terminators, even though from an, a, a UV exposure, um, the, the rest of the rig, you know, the, the um, non-terminated pieces are, are, are fine. So really with HMPE, it doesn't necessarily gain you any advantage by sheathing. If you sheath as well, you increase the diameter, you increase the wind resistance. Um, HMPE rope is, is treated by the manufacturers with coating, often polyurethane or similar coating to protect it from UV radiation. Now, over time also, the outer fibers actually uh, become more opaque and they protect the inner fibers uh, from radiation, UV radiation. Now we can see here that over time, the strength reduction we can see um, over a time of 120 months went from 100%, obviously when it was new, down to about 40%. Um, and, and so, but remember, as we said, we started off with, with, with uh, basically fiber rope that was three times stronger than the wire it is replacing. So remember that over 40% is still higher than the one third we would require uh, to be equal of equal strength to the wire rope that we're replacing. So effectively, this starts to tell you that um, effectively um, service life, um, and, and again, could be as high as um, 10 years. Typically, right now, there are a number of cases of eight years, but also remember that worst case UV radiation, and one should probably uh, define service life based on worst case, would suggest that eight years is, is a good service life. And that service life also we know in practice is within the fatigue cycles typically that, that we will we'll manage the fatigue cycles we might, we might find in that, in that time frame. So again, this is just giving you, you ideas. Um, there are, of course, other resources that, that you can read and, and um, are available that talk a lot more about this, but I'm just trying to give it from a, uh, a sort of basic point of view. And again, I had suggested that, um, you know, over time, um, obviously, the outer, outer fibers become more opaque and, and that starts to reduce further damage. So remember that the reduction is um, not linear. Um, uh, of, of the um, strength based on UV. Then again, um, I talked a bit, of, I talked already about service life. This kind of brings a few more details uh, to that. Um, and then again, I'll just uh, have a few, I'll just look very briefly at, at lifelines and then uh, running rigging, um, and then we will conclude. So lifelines, again, um, there are a number of, of um, you know, selling organizations that have embraced um, synthetic lifelines. Um, and, and again, these are typically Dyneema and Spectra. Some of these um, organizations say they need to be um, covered or sheathed. Others allow unsheathed. Um, and again, these have a different service life, which is often um, indicated by these organizations, have a different service life to standing rigging. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see here unfortunately very bad practice where the, um, the spectral dynema fiber has been actually been knotted um, onto, the, um, on, onto the pulpit or push pit. Uh, you, you should never tie, um, actually knot this type of fiber um, rigging uh, because it's, it, it actually decreases the strength easily by as much as 50%. But there are further um, texts on that um, in some of the uh, resources. Uh, a bit about running rigging. Running rigging is changing a lot based on fibers. The, of course, the most notable is soft shackles. Just a few quick notes on this. Soft shackles come in a number of different types of construction. And based on construction, and the firstly, their strength is based on the actual fiber of the, of the rope that they're made of, but also their construction. So different constructions use different knots. They use different methods here. You can see the single string or the dual string. Uh, so be very careful here 
actually you should always go to one of the the known suppliers um, and take ones that are actually have proven um, where they have actually proven the strength of the shackles. Uh, so it's just a, um, a heads up here to be very careful. Um, then looking at um, obviously there's been a great evolution in in, in blocks um, for for running rigging. Um, you have conventional blocks that have actually changed to have uh, effectively loops, synthetic loops for fastenings. Uh, and then we have a new blocks coming in, semi-static blocks and static blocks that actually use the low friction uh, of these types of, of HMPE fiber uh, such that they don't actually need rotating sheaves. But again, they can, they're can used in certain types of application uh, where there is not a lot of um, dynamics, so there's not a lot of heat generated. Um, again, the evolution here, and we're just about to finish off. Uh, we can see some examples of these. Very interesting from Ronston Marine, uh, something called a sheaveless block or, or shocks, which are, new, uh, which are new to the industry. Uh, lastly, uh, pad eyes. Uh, pad eyes are also um, moving away from their, their standard steel counterparts to become fiber. Uh, and again, there is a number of organizations providing these. There's further reading available. Uh, one is the, um, the, 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 the book um, from the IMS um, on synthetic composite yacht rigging. And then also, um, right now, um, the IMS is looking at putting together a synthetic, potentially a synthetic rigging uh, accreditation course that would again, um, go into a lot more detail around the, some of the materials that I've spoken about today. So I hope that was interesting um, and, and valuable, and I thank you all for, uh, for joining. Thank you very much, Nick, that was great. Have anyone got any questions at all they'd like to ask? We have some time available. I think you've stunned them all, Nick. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but certainly, um, if there's if there's any questions, and, and I guess this material will be uh, will, will be posted anyway. Yes, it will absolutely. We're recording everything, and it's all going to be sent out after the event. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope you. What time is it where you are now? Uh, right now it's um, six forty-five p.m. So to, um, just around the dinner hour. So that that worked well for me. Excellent. Well, I hope you have a nice evening, and thank you once again. Um, if you yeah, just thank Stop your share, that'd be great. Um, I will do. Uh, thank you all and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Nick. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you.